Hello again students. We're going to continue looking at topic one, changes in the late 19th century. Lesson two focuses us on the West and all of the changes going on there in this time period. Two themes you want to look for with this. One is the significant role that the United States government plays in implementing these changes and the settlement of the West. And the second thing is that a lot of these things are sort of movement towards corporatization of a lot of these industries as control of them and the resources starts to move into the hands of a wealthy few people or companies. Some of the first people in the West besides those native to the area will be miners. There will be a series of gold rushes in the late mid to late 19th century, uh, most famous, the California Gold Rush of 1849, but also gold rushes in places like Nevada, Colorado, uh, Idaho, Montana, and even the Yukon up in Alaska. Some of the first groups of miners will be these prospectors, individuals uh, moving out to the frontier, trying to strike it rich uh, in gold, silver, or copper. Uh, panning for these things in the rivers and basically working at the surface level. Along with these, we'll see the rise of boom towns. These are towns that sort of spring up wherever there is a gold or silver strike, oftentimes to disappear almost overnight when those gold and silver strikes dry up. Some of them, though, will diversify into industries not based around mining and will remain uh, places like Boise, Idaho and Denver, Colorado, are examples of this. Uh, most of the people who went out prospecting do not make it w rich. Uh, many of them go broke, uh, but the people who do oftentimes make a lot of money are those who go out west and provide goods and services to the miners, selling equipment and that sort of thing to them. Uh, one of the more famous examples of this would be Levi Strauss, the inventor of blue jeans, who made them for miners. Over the course of time, uh, more and more of the mining is going to be taken over by big companies, usually by the 1870s. Uh, and that would be the men you see pictured here. Uh, the, they hired a lot of immigrants, uh, particularly the Chinese, uh, but also Mexican immigrants to work some of these very dangerous conditions. But the companies had the capital to buy the heavy equipment necessary for going deeper than the prospectors could go. Um, the government encouraged these companies to uh, build out in the West by providing cheap land to them, uh, as well as patents for the inventions that they used in mining. No technological innovation in the late 19th, early 20th century is going to be more significant to the development of the United States and its economy than the railroads. Railroads will link the different regions of the United States, north, south, east, and west, allowing them to specialize in uh, manufacturing in the east and raw materials in the west, for example. Uh, and it is the main means of long distance transportation for people as well. So in the settlement of the West, many of these white and African American settlers who will move to the West in the late 19th century will do so via the railroads. Now, unlike other countries, the United States did not run its railroads through a government agency. Instead, they were privately owned companies, but the government did play a significant role in encouraging the development of railroads, particularly in the West. They will provide low interest loans, uh, grant free land to the railroad companies, uh, and uh, this land will be used by the railroads then to sell off or as collateral for a loan or maybe they'll develop it themselves along the tracks as land along railroads became very very valuable because that was where the action was uh, indeed railroads could make or break towns if a railroad chose to run a railroad track to your town your town would thrive if they chose to bypass your town it could very well die and this means that railroads were rife for corruption as towns would bribe the railroads to run lines to their towns. Uh, the first transcontinental line will be completed in 1869 uh, by the Union Pacific and Central Pacific companies. 
uh, employing mostly Irish and Chinese immigrants to do the labor. Uh, several other transcontinental lines will then spring up in the next couple decades. Uh, one of them having its terminus actually in Toledo, Ohio, a more northerly route. And then you'll have various branch lines connecting these transcontinental lines. Railroads are going to spur growth uh, and development in the west as well as industries in the east as they are connecting the raw materials with the manufacturers there. And they're going to bring in a significant amount of particularly white settlement into the West, which is going to have a very detrimental effect on those already living there, particularly Native Americans, whom we will look at more depth in topic two, and the Mexican Americans. When most people think of the Old West, they think of the cowboy. But the time of the cowboy in the open range is really less than two decades long. The open range system was one whereby cattle ranchers would brand their cattle and let them roam freely across the grasslands of Texas, Montana, and other areas. And cowboys, these young men, would be hired every year to go round up the cattle and drive them or, or take them to the cow towns, which were railroad junctions where they would be loaded up onto rail cars and shipped east, usually to Chicago where a lot of the slaughterhouses and stockyards were. Cowboy work was rough work, but it provided a lot of opportunities for people. Uh, a more than significant amount of cowboys were African American because this was a type of job that they could get easily. Uh, and many of them were also Mexican American because many of the techniques used by cowboys were actually taken from the vaqueros, uh, who were essentially the Mexican cowboys, but they pre predated the American cowboys. Uh, as I said, the open range system will not last long. It ends sometime in the 1880s, partially a victim of its own success as the overproduction of beef had driven down the price to the point that it was not as worth it to, uh, to engage in this economic activity. Uh, but also uh, the land of the West was starting to become more divided up as more farmers had moved into the area and fenced it off with barbed wire to keep the cattle out. And more and more railroads are built, creating less of a need to drive cattle to faraway cow towns as the railroad lines will run themselves closer and closer to the ranches. After the 1890 census, the Department of the Interior will declare that the frontier in America is closed, meaning that there is no area of land in the United States without significant white settlement on it. And the people probably most responsible for that are the people we see in the pictures here, farmers on the Great Plains. That's going to be the last region of the country to see that significant type of settlement that would count as settlement to the Department of the Interior. And the reason is this area is pretty rough for farming, particularly in the late 19th century. Uh, it's very arid and the soil is very difficult to get through. There's not a lot of trees for building material and so forth. Now, again, we will see the United States government playing a role in encouraging this settlement. The Homestead Act passed during the Civil War will give away 160 acres of land to anyone willing to live on it and make some sort of improvements to it, building a farm, road, and so forth. Uh, this provides a lot of opportunities for uh, poorer people and immigrants in particular, those who could afford to make it to the West, uh, usually via the railroad. Uh, and some companies encouraged immigration from like Scandinavia into areas of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and, and farther West. Uh, but also for African Americans newly uh, emancipated after the war, the exodusters settling in Kansas and Nebraska are an example of this. One of the other things that will make it possible to settle the West are several technological innovations. In this picture, you can see the steel plow, which was tough enough to dig through the deep sod, which is that top layer of soil and grass on the Great Plains, uh, which was not really doable with the old iron plows that had existed before. Uh, in addition to this, uh, there's the seed drill and the reaper making uh, farming much easier to do by turning a lot of the work over to machines, as well as barbed wire, 
a cheap way of fencing off your land, and windmills, which would be used to bring water to the surface from the Oglala Reserve uh, deep beneath the Great Plains region. A lot of these farmers, though, much like we saw with the early prospectors, will end up going bust and moving back east. Uh, it's a very difficult climate, as I said, to farm in, and 160 acres was based off of an eastern farm, not based off the climate of the west, which required a significantly larger area of land at that point. Um, and then there will be a series of nasty winters uh, and hot summers, which will ruin a lot of farmers. Uh, again, by the late 19th century, end of the 19th century, what we're seeing is that a lot of these farmers have sold off their land to large-scale landowners. So much like we saw with mining, uh, farming becomes almost corporatized or company farms by the late 19th century, early 20th century, as a few landowners and companies now own most of the farmland and are farming it with hired labor using uh, machines. The West is going to be a land of opportunity and difficulty for immigrants, minorities, and women. Uh, women are immensely important in setting up the farms of the West, uh, but also a lot of women entrepreneurs in cities like San Francisco and Seattle will set up services such as boarding houses, saloons, and brothels. And for this reason, when many of these territories become states, they include in their constitution the right to vote for women. So they're some of the first states to do so. Um, African Americans, as mentioned before, uh, could take advantage of the Homestead Act to be able to set up farms or get hired in as cowboys or also as railroad workers. Uh, and many of them, or a significant number of them, moved out of the South at this time. Uh, Mexican and Chinese immigrants faced a lot of discrimination in the West. Um, the Mexicans, and, and I hesitate to use the word immigrant, because many of them actually, their families had lived in this land for since it was part of Mexico and maybe even since it was part of the Spanish Empire. And after the Mexican-American War in uh, 1848, that land became American land. Uh, but oftentimes what they found during this time period is that white settlers would come and squat on their land, start setting up on land that belonged to them. They would take them to court. The court would force them to try to prove that it was their land when the paperwork for this was maybe in Mexico City or even in Madrid, Spain. So even if it were possible to get that paperwork by the time they went through the process and did that, they had essentially lost control of that land uh, to the settlers there. Uh, Chinese Im immigrated to the United States in significant numbers in the late 19th century, uh, some coming for the gold rush, others working on railroads, and some, as we see in this picture here from San Francisco, setting up shops. Uh, they will be subject to some pretty strict segregation laws in California, segregating into separate schools and, and other things. A lot of the stuff that we'll be more familiar with with the South and the Jim Crow era, but it was applied to uh, Asian immigrants in general, but Chinese specifically in California. And the Chinese are subject to the first ever immigration law in the United States, which is the Chinese Exclusion Act, which banned all immigration from China. We'll see a lot of conflict over resources occurring in the West, particularly water. Um, all of the different groups in the West needed to use the water. Uh, mining used it for hydraulic mining, which would create a lot of pollution, which would run downstream and pollute the water used by ranchers and farmers. Ranchers and farmers fought with each other over access to the water for irrigating their fields uh, and also over the land as the ranchers wanted to use it for cattle grazing, the farmers for raising fields. And you can see the barbed wire here, which was used to keep the cattle out of the land. Um, Mexican Americans and U.S. settlers fought over using salt, and of course everyone was taking land from the Native Americans. Let's take a look at the graphic organizer for Lesson 2 really quickly. Uh, it is a web. Uh, in each of the branches there is a statement about the West. And what you need to do in the outside bubbles is to give me an example or evidence that backs up that statement. So 
For example, if we look at mining transforming the West, you might say that big companies blew the water or railroads uh, brought products and migrants from the East as a significant change they created. Good luck. Love you. Bye-bye.